you are always connected and dialed in to the point where you are running on empty. And you don't realize it, but you are the person who drives that car and it's like grinding out, making all kinds of noises. And you pull into the mechanics and you're like, I don't know what's going on. And they're like, do you realize how many miles past service and you didn't even change the oil. You really took a beautiful machine and you treat it like crap, but you said you were seeing beauty along the way. And it, and it, and it's, just, it's not congruent. Great leaders take on the responsibility of creating rhythms and pace that feed exceptional long-term performance from the leaders in their organizations. But are they also doing that for themselves? I'm your host, Tim Spiker, and this is the Be Worth Following podcast, a production of the People Forward Network. On this show, we talk with exceptional leaders, thinkers, and researchers about what actually drives effective leadership across the globe and over time. You just heard from Jonathan Reynolds, CEO of Titus Talent Strategies. Now, if you're a person who reaches for caffeine in the morning, we might just be able to save you a few bucks today because by the time you're done listening to Jonathan Reynolds on this episode, you might not need that caffeine. Jonathan is as energetic a leader as you'll ever meet, and he's a visionary's visionary. Put those two things together, and you get a company that's been on Inc. 5000's list of fastest growing companies for four years in a row. At one point, Jonathan said to those around him that anything less than 20% growth in a given year would bore him so much that he'd quit. But he's thinking differently today. He's learning that, even as an energetic visionary, he needs to pump his own brakes once in a while and quietly invest in the health of his inner world. In addition to Jonathan's inner learnings, you'll have a chance to hear a remarkable example of how humility and self-awareness emanating from the leader's chair creates better bottom line commercial results. It's an inspiring story of how someone once multiple layers above Jonathan now reports to him. Finally, you'll get a chance to hear how Titus Talent Solutions is putting their money where their mouth is. They say they want to be an organization of generosity. Just wait until you hear what they are doing in order to make that happen. So put on your seatbelt and get ready for an inspiring, fun, and educational ride with Jonathan Reynolds. I come from a family of global travelers, global worldview, global journeyers, make an impact. We're here for a purpose. We came from a creative God who wants to show the world that they're loved. And so that's my, my, my worldview, which I grew up, my family of origin. And, uh, it was big. It was raise, raise a bunch of kids and release them to the world versus let's stay in this cul-de-sac as a family and be really tied together and let's work through our stuff together and let's keep peace. That was not, it was kind of rambunctious. It was loud. It was chaotic. So that was my kind of upbringing, which. Um, it has served me very, very well as a grown to be a quite an extroverted lover of people and from a, a generous line of people. And I think that shaped me a lot as a leader, but it's exhausting. <laughs> it is absolutely exhausting because it is almost, almost to the boundaryless life. And I think as a an extroverted leader who's grown to thrive and be energized by seeing other people's lives impacted. There is no, there is no off switch. And just as being in a people business as well, our company has grown pretty consistently somewhere in the 40 to 60% every year, which I'm really thankful for. I just saw that. The 2022 numbers came through this morning, another 50% growth. And you're like, let's do it again. Let's do it again. And I am in a raw moment of, for what? Why? Like, well, because what is the internal dialogue? Because we can impact more people. (laughs) Because we can give away more money. We can transform communities for the greater good, which would be my mantra and would be a big part of my life message generosity to impact people's lives. And I can take people on an inspiring journey of that 
But when does it end? When do you shut it off? And when do you stop and tend to your own self? Because I think as leaders, I mean, you've got to change people where you've actually been. And here I am, like, how do you manage life? How do you juggle all of the pressures and the waves that hit from every angle? And sometimes the waves hit us because we have not built the wall to protect the shore. Mm. It's really interesting to hear as, as I think about kind of your your worldview story as you unpack it there with your from your family of origin, where we start out with we're here to experience and participate and give and be generous. And and yet now we're talking about how do we tend to the inner. I want to go more deeply into that because I think there are so many truths in life and in leadership that that feel like paradoxes. And yet they, they can both be true at the same time. But before we get to that tending, I, I want to give people a little bit of a sense of your organization. Because you're talking about how you bring this worldview into your leadership. So for you as a leader, think about your leadership team that you interact with there on a, on a regular basis. Give us a day in the life of, as it is, following you and being a part of the organization and culture that you're building there. Titus Talent Strategies, we're in the talent space, helping companies with their people strategy, hiring, engagement, retention, development. Our very first client was Milwaukee Tool back in 2010, and it just took off from there. And uh, my boss's boss was kind of curious by what we were doing. He was the founder, and he had hired me, um, but I didn't report to him. And so then we started meeting, and it was kind of like, an, a, almost like a bit of a curiosity of like, what is going on here? Jonathan needs some help in his division, and he needs help because he's a little bit wild visionary. He's never ridden a horse before, but he wants to do it bareback without reins, you know? <laughs> uh, and he needs some structure. And I'm like, okay, cool, bring it on. So we would meet uh, in a Starbucks every every Monday morning, and we're reading a book together and trying to get our heads around, you know, what, what it was we were doing. Um couple of years later into this journey, um, I'm like, what, what are we doing? You know, (laughs) uh, what's the plan here with your business? And he's like, we're, we're building to sell. And I'm like, oh shoot. I didn't think about this. I've got 15 or so employees that I've been telling them that we're going to do something amazing and speckled and different. And now you're telling me that you're going to sell the company. So then I had this kind of like, do I go and start my own deal or what is the other option? The other option was buy the division that I started. So we did a buyout, carve out, whatever you want to call it. So did that, he went and sold the rest of his business, worked through the transitional period and then came over and became my business partner, my wise counsel, my, one of my best friends. What's his name? Just so we can give the credit here. Scott Seafeld. He is my business partner. He's uh, the president of the company. I sit in the CEO seat and whenever we hit an impasse following our business operating system that we, we stick religiously to. If he says, Jonathan, that's not wise or that's not a good idea or that cannot be done, I have to submit to him. So it's great. But yeah, it's just really cool journey. And here we are. And, um, never, by the grace of God, never not hit our, our, our numbers. Our big, big goal is generosity. So how do we make an impact in the world? How do we transform communities for the greater good? And how do we know the things that our team members are passionate about so that we can sew into those things so that their toughest and darkest hour of work would be inspired by they're doing something good. You've said so many things that are so worth a a deeper conversation. So we're going to definitely dig into this generosity thing, and I have some specific thoughts to ask. But before we do that, before we get too far away from your relationship with Scott, I think there's something really interesting there because he owned the company. You split yours off. Now you come over here. Now you're the CEO and he's the president. So technically on paper, that would normally be a now he's reporting to you situation. But then you throw in the little gem, by the way, I've got to submit to him. So tell me about this relationship because it sounds fascinating and very unique in the for-profit or really any organizational space. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, so we... Some of your listeners may be familiar with this. There's a, a book that was written called Traction, Get a Grip on Your Business, <laughs> written by Gina Wickman, and it's an operating system for running your business. And one of the key, what well, a key component is, there's a visionary, like many, many a great company from history, 
there are the Walt Disney's, but there's also the secondary person. And so we have the visionary and the integrator. One of the funny little nuancey principle, which is very difficult for many visionary to actually get their head around it. When there is an impasse, the integrator is the tiebreak, which requires so much humility of a visionary, of a big fill the room, fill the, fill the room with my own voice type person. Okay, that requires a lot of humility. Now, first, before I say this, did you just say you have loads of humility? You have so much humility, Jonathan? No, <laughs> I didn't say that. I'm saying when a president and founder and majority owner of a company says to the person who is too down in the organization, a director, trying to figure out what it is I'm doing, he said to me, you're the visionary and I'm the integrator. I own nothing in the company. I own nothing in the division that I started. And he says, you're the visionary and I'm the integrator. I'm like, what? You know, like I'm, my jaw is dropping going, look at the humility on this guy that he has enough humility to say, I'll, I'm going to follow you. And I'm going to lift you up on a pedestal and tell people around, follow this guy, and I'm going to help you actualize and make reality your dream. That is a truly amazing story. And that's somebody, I, I'm, I, I'm thinking, flipping heck, I want to be around this guy. Because I, like, does he make me feel good about myself? Heck yeah. I'm like, I feel released to be who I'm supposed to be. And I think that is the gift of any leader that you can make people who you are leading feel free to be who God has made them to be. And that you're going to help promote them, even if it means that you step aside to let them run. And I'm like, I have rarely ever seen this type of leadership. And now back up a little bit. Scott's used to me sort of dropping these kind of bombs, but I'm a, I'm a high school dropout. <laughs> like, he would not, and I'll just say this, he would probably not have hired me had I explicitly explained that. <laughs> well, there are certain hurdles we work our way around in life. And then once you establish yourself. The movie, the, the movie Catch Me If You Can, Leonardo <laughs> DiCaprio comes to mind. That much of my life, I'm like, shoot, people are going to find out that I'm not whatever they thought I was. That I didn't manipulate them to think that, but I definitely withheld information. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I'm guessing by the time they found out, um, it was too late. They were already loving working with you and loving the results. And there's a real honoring of one another, of superpowers. And uh, I'll be like, hey, can you, can you cover this part? Because that's your superpower. And then he'll look to me and be like, hey, tomorrow, when you stand up in front of the company, do that thing you do when you do say this and do this. It's a superpower. Go do that thing. What you see in that whole story, and I'm so glad that we spent a little more time there because it is truly an incredible example. As you mesh the concept of humility, also some self-awareness in here as well, where Scott is seeing the role and his humility and self-awareness don't bump up against this maybe classical definition that the top leader in the organization ought to be the visionary, ought to be the person who's way out there. He was comfortable enough in who he was to say, hey, I'm more of the integrator. You're more of the visionary. It's just such a clear story to me about how the inner workings of the leader, who the leader is, in this case, you and Scott, who you are, enable a much higher level of performance because you're not playing in the sandbox with all of the classical definitions of who ought to do what and how the reporting structure works, like all of that gets set aside in favor of people being who they were created to be and producing exceptional results because that space was created for them. It's such a business argument, frankly, for being clear about who you are and getting comfortable with that and leaning into it and enabling others. 100%. Talk us through what applied generosity as a, as a significant value and goal of the organization. What does that look like in the day-to-day -day of Titus, in the day-to-day -day of a for-profit enterprise? Talk to us about how that gets applied and what it looks like. We just got done with the holidays and Scrooge. You're like, well, oh, don't <laughs> want to be a Scrooge, you know. Don't want to be a miser. And I promise you, any business owner who's listening to this, if you post a picture of you 
swimming in your money like Scrooge McDuck. <laughs> like, your disengagement will go through the roof. Do you think any of your employees care what car you drive? I don't think they actually care what car you drive. I don't think they would even care if you had a boat. They do care what you do with everything that you have. So if you are willing to carve out some, not just to put more money in the pockets of your people, but to say, what is it that you care about in the way of your circles and your spheres? What do you care about impacting? Because I realized we used to have a giving component and I have this amazing privilege of pressing a certain button that makes money leave our bank account and go to things that our employees care about. And I'm like, this is so cool. Originally, it was things that I cared about. And I'm like, I love this. That was great sending that money. And then I realized the thing that it did to me and the chemicals it released in my body when I got to give, I'm like, that feels good. <laughs> How do I allow everyone in the company to have that same feeling? Well, I can say, well, you give your money. I give my money, you give your money. Or I can say, let's give us some of our money that we've created together by the work that we do. What do you care about? Let's give together. Let's ha give you the opportunity to hand the check. And that feeling then of today was a really hard day or this week was a tough week or I put in some extra time and I'm like, hey, you put in extra time or you create extra value. I'm like, hey, I want to I want to compensate you for that. But there's another piece which let's make an impact together. And I want you to have the privilege and the joy of knowing that the work that you did impacted what you care about. What if you said, oh, gosh, we're trying to raise money for our little, my son's little league deal. They really need new kits, new outfits. And they go, hey, I'd like to uh, cover that. Like you would like, well, it's actually part of my company. We love to do things in the community. Oh, wow. You want to be a sponsor? No, no. We just want to get new kits. To know that you're, the work that you did mattered to your community in a good way or whatever it is, you know, like. I, I can tell you story after story on this one, but uh, the feel good factor where they got the privilege of saying, click, we're paying for that. I think it's massive. So many business owners think that their employees should be thankful that they have a great potluck on Thursdays and gift card. It's kind of like, really, you know, but give them the carve out something of generosity and give them the privilege of giving. I think there's a huge component. It's better to give than receive. And I've never seen a grumpy, generous person. This has an interesting twist because you guys help place people into organizations. And I am just going to go out on a limb and say you're helping people land in places that, well, they may not have the perspectives and, and, and applications that you just described at Titus. So... What is it like as you're matching people potent to potential careers and organizations? Are there only certain kinds of organizational cultures that you work with? Or is it, you know, everybody's different. And even if they run their businesses in dramatically different ways than we would never, ever do here at Titus, we can still help find people for those kinds of organizations. How does it work for you in the placement space? Yeah, that's good. Well, one of our unique things is that's going to put us on the map as really caring about the right fit, if you will, or the right addition to the company. And because we care about that, we've set our sights on the anniversary date of the first year anniversary. Like it's not about getting the person to show up. It, ultimately anyone can hire somebody, but then there's this big experiential piece of that first 90 days, one week, one month, 90 days, six months where you're kind of like, I hope they're the right person. So we set our, our mile marker of anniversary date. That's how many people can we place that by their anniversary date, they crush their performance objectives. Here's what 100% of your salary looks like. Here's what 100% performance looks like. Are we all agreed on that? What percent of people actually crush that? And then we thought, here's that wild visionary spot kind of shows up again. Like, wouldn't it be crazy if we charged our fees on the anniversary date a year later? And the great thing about an integrator like mine is they tell you something, they go, it's called cash flow. You can't run a business that way. And I go, oh, <laughs> thank you for that. But we, we agreed on like, they would, our clients would cover our cost, operating costs, 
and there'll be no reward until the anniversary date. You found a way to make it happen while also taking into account the business needs. So, totally. so we're going to be okay on cash flow to cover our expenses. But when you start talking about profits, when you start talking about where it really hits the bottom line, we don't see that until we make sure that things happen for the balance of a year. Totally. And so wow. first year, first year, it's kind of like, you know, but then it catches up. But so we get rewarded for great work later down the road. Delayed gratification is a great principle if you have kids. <laughs> but it works for adults too. So, so because that's our, our kind of mile marker of success, like what percentage people actually kill it and crush it, and align with the company's vision and values, it, it, it puts the owners on us to do a little bit more homework on understanding the environment they're going into, culture, values, all of that kind of stuff. And so we talk about it's, there's a seat that needs to be filled. Somebody is going to sit in there. It's not going to be a resume. So we look at people, we call it the head, the heart, the briefcase. Head is their behaviors and cognitive. What goes, how are they wired intrinsically? If I shout the word fire, we all behave in certain ways. Some kind of go to, you know, grab their valuables. Some just run and drop everything. Some go and make sure everyone else is okay. Like we all behave in a certain reactive way when the pressure's on, the pressure's off. We want to understand how people think, how they process information. Then the heart is all about values and motivation. What are their values as a person to the line with the company? And what motivates them? Why are they motivated to resign from a position and go to another position? Like, why do they make the decision they made? Why do they go to the school they went to? Why do they choose this route? You know, understanding their motivation, that kind of the heart, if you will. And then last, the other third is the, we call it the briefcase, a bit of an old fashioned term, but what do they bring to the table by way of skills and experience? And it's the skills and experience what they do with those skills and experience and what they have done in the past that we're really digging into. Like just because you went to school for something and then you had seven years of experience, on, doesn't mean you're actually any good at it. So we actually go, what did you do with the knowledge and experience that you had and what are you big things you've accomplished? So it's a third, a third, a third. If I could figure out what was needed, the thirds, behaviors, values, and skills, then I can match somebody to that with the right motivations, the right behaviors, and the right skills. That makes total sense. You know, the briefcase that maybe doesn't get used very well. There are a few people on the planet who end up a little surprised when they find out that, that my my technical briefcase from educational days is electrical engineering. <laughs> and I share with people frequently, and it is a very true statement, that the world is a safer place because I am not a practicing engineer. So, yeah, the briefcase. And not just where you went to school, not just what you studied, but what are, you, what are your real skills and experiences that are going to get applied in addition to the head and the heart as well. Um, you, you mentioned the idea of the organization here, just looking at my notes, hiring, engagement, retention, and development. And so I'm curious, what does development look like for Titus with its clients? Because that would almost seem to be a value add in that industry from my perspective. Tell us a little bit about why development comes into the equation and what that looks like for what Titus is doing. I think it really comes down to most companies have a, a mission, uh, whether you're building to sell your company, whether you're building to make some big impact, how would you know when you're successful or not? What, what are we trying to do here? And coming from that perspective, it's probably going to take people to get there. Wouldn't it be amazing if all of those people, their own kind of setting their stars in the course of their life aligned? Like, no, I actually want to do that. Whether you're a tool design, electrical tool design manufacturing company, and you're like, no, we want to be on the absolute cutting edge of, to help help the construction industry with tool, like amazing tools that keep them healthy and safe and ergonomic and blah, blah, blah. You know, like somebody's like, no, I really want, that's, that's what I want to do. I want to be on the cutting edge of that stuff. Why? Well, my family grew up, the, you know, there's probably a story of why or what motivates that. And that's, that's great. So dig into those things. Wouldn't it be great if everyone in your organization was really passionate about that? And there are plenty of organizations that don't, they actually don't have that. I mean, even our, I'm like, we're always looking at engagement. Like, how do I get people to be more engaged? Essentially, 80, 90% of what we do is helping a company identify what they need or who they need to, in a role in their company. And then we go and steal that person from another company. That's essentially what we do. So it's going to be good as long as we're really transparent what they're going into because A, players don't make lateral moves or, you know, they don't run away from things, they run towards things. So it's good for the people. Often they get more, more income as well. That's not really why A players primarily make career moves, though. So does it feel good for Titus team members 
the in the work they do. Like, yeah. I, so we actually hired somebody. We put them in a role. Just call the people that we placed ninety days after they've been there and ask them. Since they took that job, how has it impacted their life personally, not work related? Because our team members, we recognize our team members need to hear these stories to make them feel good about what they do. Like, somebody's like, oh, I love that I moved over to this company. Now I get to travel less. I get to be more present for my family. I get to do this. I actually get to see my kids growing up, and it's amazing. Thank you so much to so-and-so who called me and asked me if I was open to exploring a career move if it was truly superior for me. The answer was yes, and my life was transformed. We're, so we, we stick out little postcards, electronic postcards, and we send that to the whole company. And we let the person who recruited them read it in front of the whole company. Every week we used to do that. So how do you help companies, back to your question of development, like you've got, you've got your company dream, you've got your company kind of vision, where you're trying to go, and it takes people to get there. And so when you recruit or hire somebody, you bring them into this, organization, they have a career often, especially the rate players, the people we're recruiting, they have a career aspiration, a career path that they would like to go on. So we help companies to start thinking in three-year pictures with the people they bring in. We have a 10-year dream, we call it a 10-year core target, and it's by 2030, we want to give away $30 million to transform communities to the greater good in and through our people. And so I just, I just looked at the stats. We're 48% of the way there, three years into it, which is really exciting. So I'll tell the company tomorrow. But knowing that every one of our team members has a career aspiration, and it might not be with us. Jim Collins says, right people on the bus. And there's the idea here is that people get on the bus for their journey. You, the driver thinks like it's trying to get to the end of its shift, <laughs> finish the entire route. But the driver also needs to realize that everybody on the bus will not be there all the way to the end of the route. They don't end up at the bus depot or bus station. <laughs> like, no, no. I was trying to get someone. Everybody also has their somewhere they're trying to get to. Maybe it's financial. Maybe it's development. Or maybe it's growth. Maybe it's experience. Maybe it's one day I want to know how to manage a P&L. And I want somebody to help me do that really, really well. Could I do that at this company or do I have to go somewhere else to do that? So they all have this kind of idea or a dream of what they want to do. And I think it's probably the principle if I was to take a group photograph of, I, of our company at the next company gathering and I email it to everybody, by nature, everybody is going to look for themselves in the picture, right? Oh, gosh, do they really look like that? You know, like, can we do a redo? No, it already happened. Sorry. <laughs> That's just by nature. Now, if I could take a group photograph of the company that we will be in three years' time, people want to know if they're, they're in it. Like, am I in it? It's kind of fortune telling, right? Am I there? Like, will I be in the same spot as I am today or will I be in a different part of the picture? I doubt that everyone would be in the same spot in three years' time. So develop. How do you develop people for what's next? And what if what's next is not with you? <laughs> so we want to always be developing people for what's next because the company really does exist exist for a reason. Like we had somebody they wanted to, they they were they were all basically running this not for profit simultaneously to their role at Douglas. And they're like, hey, I really I've come to the point where I want to do this full time. All right, that's amazing. How do we support you? How do we support you in starting your own not for profit and leaving us? <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, we were able to do that. And I think that's really cool. And then the, of the service of their not-for-profit would actually potentially benefit some of our employees. So I'm like, hey, cool. Can we, add you, can we add your resource to our kind of development of our people? Like, absolutely. Great. So I think just being okay with the fact that sometimes people ring the bell on the, and say, hey, I'm not, this is my stop. And we, we've got to let people, not let them leave with dignity, but send them off with dignity and celebration. And sometimes that's hard because sometimes they're like literally going to a competitor or whatever. Somebody offered me a little more money and you're like, celebrate that. You know, like, <laughs> you know and these are things that we have to navigate. And I think that there are ways of doing it that doesn't create a negative negativity in your culture, but we have to navigate that. You know, folks have probably heard me say this before, but if we can engage in an ongoing dialogue with people such that we know what their hopes and dreams are and that we see the organization 
as a factor in helping them go on that journey. They're not just here for us. We're here for them as well. And the thing that I, w- that I have said before is just quoting Andy Stanley talks about launching people instead of losing them. And I think that that's such an interesting perspective that really keeps us as leaders in the position of stewards as opposed to owners. We don't own the people that we're leading. We are, in fact, perhaps responsible for how we contribute to where they're heading. It's not just about what we get for them and what happens to the relationship and the engagement and the productivity for everybody when we have more of a stewardship and launching perspective instead of I own you and if you leave here, then I've lost you. And it's just a very different way of looking at the people that we're leading. Very, very much so. And I, I think, I think to recognize, I think here's my own personal journey. I'm like, I'm figuring these things out myself. Like, Cause I hate, I hate failure. I hate it deeply. I mean, like, I want people to like me. I kind of, <laughs> I don't want people to like, oh, the worst would be like, dude, that guy is not, he doesn't walk in the way he says he walks. I'm like, oh, but I also, I'm going to screw up. <laughs> like, ask my kids, you know? Um, and I think just becoming, coming to the point of realizing that we can't live a, a perfect life and we're not, we're not supposed to. Um, and we want to, we want to keep, I mean, that's not an excuse for bad behavior, but, uh, but to recognize when we do screw up and, and clear up our mess as best we possibly can. And sometimes clear up the mess, like you can't actually make it not happen. But when it does, you can't bury it. I, I don't know. It's a, it's a tough thing. You mentioned earlier that even as we go back to your, to your story of growing up and your family and the worldview that they provided, that there's all of this flowing out. And yet, at the same time, where are, where are the walls of protection? Where, where are the efforts to tend to what's going on on the inside of the leader? And I think this is such an important topic, especially from a, an outgoing, gregarious visionary like yourself, because, and I'm just going to, I'm just going to say this. And if you're listening, you're going to have to do the work to figure out if this is you. But there are some of us out in the marketplace who have that leaning towards outward facing, really engaging, almost as if we're on stage at all times. And we're doing that in an unhealthy way. We're doing that because we're afraid to be quiet with ourselves. We're afraid to pull the curtain back and look at what's really going on. And it's ultimately, in the end, that story crumbles eventually. And Jonathan, what you're talking about is, hey, yeah, I can be out here for other people, generosity, outward facing, but there's an inner world that needs a foundation, that needs a stability, even in that outgoing visionary leader. And I want you to talk about that a little bit, because I think it's so important that for those that might put themselves in that category, that that they pause, that we pause to say, oh, what about the foundational underpinning that isn't about being out there and in front of people and promoting things and being excited about the vision, that part that comes before that. So talk a little bit about that, that grounding and inner work from your perspective as a leader. Um, cool. Self-awareness. <laughs> I just think to pause, pause and go, like, how self-aware am I actually with what's going on? I, I, let's assume that anyone listening to this have people in their life that know them somewhat well, intimately, that, that see probably your blind spots. And then having the humility to ask those people like, hey, can you tell me what's going on in my blind spot? Can you see what I can't see in my life? I've done this, asked this question to our, some of the senior leaders at, at Titus. Finish this sentence with an eye roll. That's so Jonathan. <laughs> like, what is it that people are saying when they go, that irritates the crap out of us when he does that. Because it drains the energy of those around me and I'm unaware of it. And if I can get that thing calibrated in my life, it will help me and it will help others. It's the ordering a private world. Hey, when you say that, are you specifically referencing that book? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, interestingly enough, he said in that, you know, in that book or the, or the sequel, which was reordering your broken world. 
An unguarded strength is a double weakness. You're like, I'm awesome at this. Well, you probably should put some boundaries and parameters and checkpoints and side mirrors on it to see your blind spots because you, your, your ego is blinding. My beautiful, loving wife, very gracious and kind, would say to me, like, you can get more done in a day than most people can get done in a week. And I go, damn right. You know, the other side when we look at that go, yeah, because you don't have any boundaries. And look at your private world. And you are always connected and dialed in to the point where you are running on empty. And you don't realize it, but you are the person who drives that car and it's like grinding out, making all kinds of noises. And you pull into the mechanics and you're like, I don't know what's going on. And they're like, do you realize how many miles past service is? You didn't even change the oil. You really took a beautiful machine and you treat it like crap. But you said you were seeing beauty along the way. And it's, just, it's not congruent. And I think that, that, that pause to be like, well, what does servicing this look like? What does putting the right oil in here? What does premium look? Why do we put premium in it? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, and we, we hear this with our life, we don't actually take a stock of our life and go, okay, am I worth, like, and that's where self-worth comes in. Am I worth taking care of? Am I worthy of premium? Am I worthy of rest? Am I worthy of slowing down? Now, I was speaking to one who just got off of six days, absolute rest. I was doing deep work in my own life and I got you know, off of rest. I had no technology for six days. Like this is my first day back. Wow. And it was good, man. It was really, really good. I didn't want to pick up the cell phone. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about, as, as somebody who values this investment. Just to be clear, I have never valued this investment until now until now say more say a little more about that Remember the quote you can do more than in one day than most people can do in a week there is a price to pay for that the price was great and i wish it upon no one so so are you now kind of emerging into uh perhaps a, a, an, a, an adjusted perspective where you're going to invest more in your own health and well-being along the way? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's the stuff. Like, yeah, we can talk about health and wellness of our physical body. That's great. And that the heart takes longer to heal than the physical body. And taking the, do the deep work on that, go, what the heck happened there? How did I get into this? And I'm somebody, I mean, you ask anybody a Titus. Like, um... Uh, like we have themes each year and they're all about us growing because anything less than 20% growth year over year is boring as anything to me. <laughs> like we, we have, the, it's actually in our company manifesto. I, th I think it's written in there. Anything less than 20% year over year growth is so boring that Jonathan will quit. <laughs> like how messed up is that where the, fa the owner and CEO says, I'm going to quit if you don't make sure that we grow 20%. Like, what? No, I still, I still care about growth. I'm saying it's like, what's up with that? But, but it sounds like a threat. Like what a horrible threat. <laughs> I'm like, I, I, can, I can rephrase it and I will rephrase it. Why does it have to be so extreme? And I'm an extreme person, you know, but I'm learning this whole, you know, you see my mug, two degree shift. And I stood up in front of the company and talked about the two degree shift that we need to make. Little things each day so that we grow and tend to ourselves and care that we're not trying to be really, really drastic. And this is, I mean, like you, anybody who knows me would laugh out loud by that statement I just made. They'd be like, BS. <laughs> you're, hey, you're on a journey too. I mean, I think this yeah. is important. It's true for every single one of us as leaders. As much as we want to think about how are we helping others to walk a path of development, especially the leaders that we're developing. The fact of the matter is we are also on a path of development ourselves. And so, yeah, maybe it is BS when you look at your past, but it may not be your BS when you look at your present and your future. Exactly. Yeah. And that's where you're starting from. One, one of the things that's important is leaders pursue the idea of being holistically healthy. 
which is not the pursuit of being perfect Zen. It just means that you're paying attention to all the different aspects of life and do I have health and margin in those places. One of the things that's told time and time again around habit formation and growth is this idea, when you talk about two degrees, you know, if, if you improve 3% each month over the course of two years, at the end of two years, you will be 100% better than you are today. And this is hard for us, especially the visionaries. It can be hard to say, okay, that incremental improvement in my habits, that incremental improvement in my rest, that incremental improvement in my disciplines, that that's going to get us somewhere. But there is a compounding effect that happens over time that's tremendous. And we have a much better chance of sticking with those changes in, in most cases, I know there are exceptions, but in most cases, we will stick with the changes in that aspect of our life, our habits, our practices, our disciplines, when they are incremental, than if they are just massively changed overnight. That's called a New Year's resolution. That fails 80% of the time. So I love where you're heading. And I love, I love for people to hear you're imperfect and on a journey, just like every other leader which is really important as we have these podcasts and we talk about the great things that organizations and leaders are doing, but to also say, yeah, but it's not perfect. Yeah, but I'm working on me. Yeah, I'm learning how to rest. Yeah, I'm learning how to put premium in the tank. Yeah, I'm learning that I'm worth it. Yes, there was a price to All of that is true for us too. And I think we need to give ourselves the grace to be in process and imperfect while we try to get better and better. And I love that you're doing that. I do. I'm with you. Everything, everything you just said, totally with you. It's, it's so true. I am committing to the, the long journey of life. I feel at peace with myself for, on this journey now, I'm like, which I feel more peace now than I've thought in a long, long time. Just coming off of a, I'm not going to be subject to the demands of everything and everyone or the opportunities. What an incredible joy it was to visit with Jonathan. So many unique perspectives from an incredibly energetic and visionary leader. There's a few things I want to take a moment to make a note of. First, I want to start with where we ended up the conversation as Jonathan was talking about his investment in his own inner world. Here you have a very outgoing and energetic leader who is taking pause who is thinking about where does that energy come from for me to be able to give to others as a leader at home, as a leader at work? And how do we invest in that? How do we take care of the engine? How do we take care of that car that is running? And what happens when we don't, when we don't pause? Well, what happens when we don't give it maintenance like we need to? And what you heard was that he's on his own journey as well. We're, we're not these fully developed, perfectly formed leaders. We're learning as we go along. And what you heard in his story is that he is entering into a space where he's thinking more intentionally about taking care of what's on the inner side of who he is so that he can be healthy and he can be the very best that he has to give to his leadership endeavors. And I just think that's so important in the work that we do with our clients. We call this being holistically healthy. And when we as leaders invest in being healthy. And I don't mean just physically healthy. I mean physically. I also mean financially, vocationally, intellectually, emotionally, relationally, mentally, and spiritually. As we invest in those areas of our lives, as we create health and margin, there are two wonderful things that produces for us as leaders and ultimately impacts the people around us with. And those two things are resilience and capacity. When we are holistically healthy leaders, we show up with greater resilience and greater capacity. We can take a punch and the challenges of leadership better. That's the resilience. And capacity is our ability to take advantage of the opportunities that present themselves, to perform at a high level over a very long period of time. So I love that Jonathan shared that part of his story with us. And I love that he shared that he's in process on it. It's not something he's got perfectly figured out. He's heading into waters that are somewhat new in many ways to him as he invests in the care of himself. And I just love that he shared that with us. And I love that for him. Another thing I want to take a moment to take note of is the interaction between him and Scott. 
Now, just as a reminder, he worked for Scott originally. Actually, Scott was a couple layers above him in the original organization. As he launched Titus Talent Solutions, now he's the CEO and Scott is the president. And the key, the key to their interaction where Scott is enabling Jonathan is this idea where Scott shows up with such humility. And it inspires, as you heard Jonathan say, it inspires Jonathan to greater humility now they are learning from and deferring to uh, to one another. It's not the loudest ego is the best idea, and that's where we go. But it's how do we how do we see and actually listen to one another? And you heard in in the way Scott was approaching things initially, as Jonathan was again a couple of layers below him in the organization, to be able to go to somebody and say you're the visionary. I'm more of a in, in the EOS language more of an integrator. I'm the implementer. I'm the person that's going to think about how this could really work. But you're, you're the visionary who has the big ideas. And so what came before all of the roles and responsibilities and how things were organized and the selling of the business and, and then Scott becoming president, where Jonathan is now organizationally over top of him with regard to CEO, before any of that happened, before any of that showed up, was humility from Scott that inspired humility from Jonathan. 77% of our effectiveness as leaders comes from who we are, not what we do. And humility is certainly a part of who we are and who we can be. And you heard an incredible business case for how humility can show up and make an organization better. Finally, I want to end by focusing on just two words that Jonathan said in the middle portion of our discussion. He was talking about the value of generosity at Titus and the idea that the organization would give money away in support of causes that are important to the people that work there. And he said two words there that really got my attention. I wrote them down the minute that he said it, and these are the two words, our money. Even as an owner in the organization, he's looking at the dollars that are produced by the organization as not my money, but our money. And I think that is an incredible perspective to consider. When we as leaders, even if we're not business owners, but we're leaders of major divisions or publicly traded companies, do we look at what we are producing here? Really, really, truly, do we look at it as ours? If we can have that perspective, I think that would impact so much positively for how we interact with the people that we are leading. And all the more amazing, if you're an owner of an organization, to be able to look at the financial value that's created and call it ours. What an amazing perspective. And so that leads me to the question I want to leave you with today. And that is this. When you look at the results, including the finances, that those you are leading are producing, are you thinking of it as ours? I'm Tim Spiker, reminding you to be worth following and to follow us wherever you get your podcasts. If you've heard something valuable today, please share our podcast with your friends and colleagues. And if you're up for it, leave us a five-star review. Thanks for listening.